good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here in Cambridge with you. And uh, I'd obviously like to thank Aubrey, all the hard-working members of the SENS team, and the staff here at Queen's itself for putting on such a wonderful event. Uh, I hope in this very short presentation to be able to give you perhaps one or two statistics that you haven't heard elsewhere before about why orthodox medicine must change. Um, I've put a little cartoon on here uh, to try and sort of give an idea of uh, this idea. Uh, you, perhaps if you can read it, the patient is saying, Doctor, I don't feel well, but I'm not sure why. And in rather, unlike rather an orthodox doctor who's going to perhaps say, oh, that's easy, we'll put you on an antihypertensive, on a statin and on an SSRI, and you can go home. This guy's saying, I want you to meditate for 20 minutes twice a day, exercise for 30 minutes a day, avoid processed foods, eat plenty of organic fruit and veg, spend more time in nature and less indoors, stop worrying about things you can't control and ditch your TV. So just a sort of concept of uh, how we have to change our uh, outlook, as it were. You all know this, and I think if we walked out into the street uh, when stopped a member of the public at random, you'd say, is lifespan increasing? And they'd say, oh yes, yes, orthodox medicine is increasing lifespan regularly. And indeed, in some respects, we can argue that's exactly correct. This is the statistics for the United States uh, showing men and women. And uh, rather surprisingly, uh, the United States is 27th in the league tables uh, for longevity, with uh, Japan as major countries, Japan, Australia, and France actually leading the way. But as we'll come to see, this is not the entire picture. So what can we expect now? On average, once we reach the age of 65, men can expect to live approximately 15 years, and women can expect to live approximately 18 years, and that's uh, compounded when you consider that a child born in 2000 can now expect to live 30 years longer than one that was born in 1900. How is the population changing? Here are the statistics for Italy. And this was the year 2000, uh, showing the numbers of men and women available in various age brackets. And as you can see, the majority of people here are in this quadrant, where they're in their 30s, they're in their 40s. Um, and that's all fine and dandy if you have a system that is reliant upon supporting the people who are alive up here in terms of their health care and in terms of their pensions, etc., with our current programs, because you have many people contributing in this, in this quadrant. But as we move on and we look at the statistics again for Italy for the year 2025, which, let's be honest, is only around the corner, uh, we now see it looking like one of these uh, old-fashioned spinning tops for children, where we see these people, these baby boomers, these people born between um, the Second World War and the Korean War, are moving upwards, and now they're becoming in their 50s and 60s and 70s. So this is a fundamental change. And now looking ahead to 2050, which I'm sure all of us in this room hope to see, um, we see a very different picture. We now see for Italy an almost inverse pyramid, where we, where we have many people in their 70s and 80s, and under the current system, it clearly would not be supportable because these people who are working and paying taxes would, would not generate enough income to support these guys if it was all to stay as it is. This is a, a nice little statistic that I managed to grab from the Central Intelligence Agency Factbook. So it's good to know that whilst they're spying on us regularly, uh, they are sharing some of this information. <laughs> um, You've probably heard that Barack Obama was stopped in a, in a, in a sorry, I'm a bit of a rap on tail like telling jokes. It's a very short presentation, and I shouldn't do this, but I, I'm going to tell a joke anyway. Um, and the Barack Obama was stopped in a, in a classroom, and the, a child said to him, Mr. President, my dad says you're spying on us. To which the president replied, he's not your dad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So this, this is quite an interesting statistic. These, these bubbles show the difference of life expectancy between men and women by various countries and also by continents. Now clearly you don't want to live in Angola where, you, where you're likely, not likely to see the age of 40. But very interesting, I'm sure if we ask you, you guys, very educated guys, very knowledgeable guys on this subject, which country could we expect to have the longest life expectancy, I'm sure you'd all say Japan. And certainly that's true. But look at these guys. We have Macau and we have Monaco. 
So, uh, and you might say, well, they're not countries, but the hero recognises them as such. So they're very small territories, full of very wealthy people, so I don't know if that gives us a clue for life expectancy. Um, worldwide ageing trends. Dr. Appleby very eloquently described these. I, uh, excuse me to show you it in slightly different fashion, but you can see that in 2000 there were 600 million people aged 60 and over, and there'll be 1.2 billion by 2025 and 2 billion by 2050, and in contrast, those between the ages of 15 and 59 are expected to increase by 16%, and those under 15 by 5%. But in comparison to those who are over 80, they're going to grow by 400%. So clearly, we are going to have a society of older people. And I would totally agree with his statement that this is not a bad thing. And I think this is a public perception that we have to change. Being old does not mean not being lucid, not being agile, and being, not being independent. And as opposed to the L'Oreal adverts, it does not mean we're all going to look like Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. But we all want to be lucid and agile and independent. I think that's a fundamental goal. Uh, I do have one bit of good news to say uh, for any gentlemen in the audience. It is known that in very old age, the ratio of females to men is two to one, so we will be in demand. I won't tell my wife that. Um, <laughs> this to me is perhaps the most important slide I'm going to show you today in this short presentation. This is for the United Kingdom. It shows uh, the health span versus the lifespan. I don't need to explain that to this audience. You know what that means. You can see that in 1981, what the lifespan was and what the health span was as opposed to 2001, uh, the comparison. Now, there, had, there was an increase in men between those 20 years of lifespan of 4.8 years. But the health span only rose by 2.6 years. So in effect, men in 1981 enjoyed 89% of their lives in good health, which dropped to 87% 20 years later. And that's, of course, you can see that the actual uh, years of sickness <coughs> has actually increased also. And the same thing for women. Uh, women between 81 and 2001 increased their lifespan by 3.6 years, but their health span only rose 2.1 years. So again, I know, lies, damn lies and statistics, but in effect, women in 81 enjoyed 87% of their lives in good health, which dropped to 86% 20 years later. So I think this is a really fundamental message we need to get out to the public. Uh, it's quite clear, I think, that if we improve health span, we will improve lifespan. But this really sits well with the public thinking. The implications of ageing, very quickly, old age dependency rates will rise in every major region. Minutes. Thank you. And the elderly support budget in 2025 is 50% larger than it was in 98. And in 2020, hey, that's not far away, uh, one in five by today's standards are going to be considered elderly. Now, this is uh, quite common knowledge in the United Kingdom, the National Health Service, as I'm sure you know. Uh, they've already said that if numbers continue as they are, Diabetes treatment will use £16.9 billion of the budget as the number of diabetics is expected to rise from 3.8 million to 6.25 by 2035. What does this mean? It means that just trying to treat diabetes as it is today will bankrupt the United Kingdom's NHS. So something has to change. Very quickly, I think again another important slide. If we stopped and said, well, what are diseases? it would be very quick to say there are four categories. You have inherited disease, you have infectious disease, you have traumas, and you have degenerative disease, which I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted in this room, you'll all agree are the diseases of ageing. Well, what if we looked at the financial costs that we spend on these, what do we find? We find that in the United States, 90%, 90% of the budget is spent on degenerative diseases. Now, I've had some arguments with various people, including Thomas Stoppard of the Times, Medical Correspondent of the Times, but it's generally agreed that in all major countries, the cost on degenerative health care is between 75 and 90 percent of the spend. <coughs> so just imagine if we can just make a small dent in that big chance of the pie, it's going to make an enormous difference. What can be done? When we stop and think about it, and I know Aubrey's spoken often on this kind of subject, are we just going to make the future working populations pay 70% or more in taxes to maintain the system as it is? Will we allow more of the age to just end their lives in discomfort and disease? Will we adopt low birth rates? Are you ready to live in a society that will um, say how many children you can have? 
or are you, conversely, ready to live in a society that will have euthanasia and says, hey, hey, John, well done, you're 70, you're in good shape, and <laughs> it's time to go. I don't think so. I think we're probably going to want the last one, aren't we? We want to instigate lifelong health education and adopt preventative and regenerative medicines. Uh, this is, as a pharmacist, I have to be practical in some respects um, and, and to try and explain things. This is my concept of the optimal health pyramid. A pyramid, of course, has a lot of material at the base, so they become the things you have to do regularly. That's why I call it the basics, the lifestyle, the diet, etc. Additionals may be nutrition, chelation, methylation, etc. You might say that advanced, where you get healthcare professionals involved, but you know, certainly today in anti-aging, we see a lot of identical hormone replacement, for example. And at the premium end, we may argue that stem cells and telomerase activation and things may be there. You can play with these uh, these placements as much as you like, but I just like to think that there's a way of thinking about uh, how we create an optimal health uh, regimen for an individual. It's so are, interesting. I am coming to the conclusion. Uh, Have I got one minute? I, but sorry. So just going into the future, um, you know, I think we'll agree that uh, regenerative preventative medicine makes sense on so many levels. Personal, family and friends. Uh, who doesn't want to be around with their family and friends? Well, okay, sir, yes, and maybe not the mother-in-law, thank you for that. Uh, uh, social, financial, and business. And um, I'd like to thank you very much for listening. <laughs>